So, soon we're back in the big, wide, bad world. <laughs> but it's not really so bad. So sometimes when people leave retreats, there's a tendency in myself as well. Not so much nowadays. <coughs> yes, the circle is complete. <laughs> right intention. Excellent. So yeah, we can feel that when we, you know, go back into the outside so-called world where we're likely to be more busy than we are in retreat, that somehow we're not able to practice quite as deeply or it's maybe not as profound a practice. And it's true that we might not have so much time to sit. But it's really nice to try and see everything you practice as aligned in some way to the Eightfold Path because you will always be either practicing a livelihood or speaking or having some kind of activity. And so all of these can be aligned to become right speech, right livelihood, right, act, right uh, conduct. Yeah? So whatever we do, we can align it in that way. And all of these factors feed into each other and will ultimately strengthen the sitting practice. And the other nice way to look at being outside is that it gives you a chance to see where your qualities are growing and where you are making progress on the path and also which areas still need a little bit of attention. And that's absolutely fine and it's natural that we have our strengths and weaknesses. But sometimes we're not quite aware of that until we go outside and see the way we react to certain situations. Sometimes you might find you react exactly the same way as you used to react. But then you'll notice that you only do that like five times out of six and not six times out of six, <laughs> which is really great, right? So this is already a big progress and, and the more you practice then you realise, oh, it's only like three times out of six now that I react in that way. And perhaps also the reactivity period starts to lessen because we have this wonderful tool of mindful awareness, right? And together with the compassion and the loving kindness, this, the Buddha says, is a protection for you and also a protection for others. So by adding the loving kindness to whatever you're aware of, you protect. And you protect both, ideally. You know, yourself from more harm and yourself from harming others as well. So this is very beautiful and don't expect huge results from a short retreat, but I think most of you have been practicing a while and you've probably got enough confidence that these things do start to seep into the psyche somehow or other in time. So I wanted to talk a bit about how to practice loving kindness more in community and drawing on the Buddhist suttas a little bit and just some of my own reflections as well. And uh, I wanted to start with a nice sutta in this wonderful book. I'll probably be sending you links to these resources at some point. And it's called The Six Principles for Cordiality. There's also 10 principles of cordiality, but I didn't want to overwhelm you. So these six principles are basically a way to maintain, maintain harmony in community and to develop harmony. And also, it's about reciprocal kindness, good conduct. And it goes against the stream of selfishness, because you're thinking about others and how to share, basically, whatever you have with the people around you. So this is the Buddha speaking to the monks or the community, but we'll just change that to community because it applies to any situation that you find yourself in. And these are said to create affection, respect, conduce to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. So these things are very highly praised by the Buddha. So here, one maintains bodily acts of loving-kindness towards their fellow people in society, both openly and privately. This is a principle of cordiality that creates effect, affection and respect and conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. Again, one maintains verbal acts of loving-kindness towards fellows in, let's just say his fellows, both openly and privately. This too is a principle of respect that creates affection, sorry, a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. Again, one maintains mental acts of loving kindness towards one another, both openly and privately. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect 
and conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. So these are the body, speech and mind, and I love the way it talks about both publicly, openly and privately. Because it's one thing to behave a certain way to somebody when everybody's <laughs> watching, you know, and you want to sort of maintain a good self-image, but it's another thing to actually go away and, you know, behave that way, you know, when no one else can see you. Or you have a word with somebody that you've never sort of said to them in public, but you think, oh, I can get away with it because no, no, nobody knows. And after that, it says, one shares without reservation any righteous gains that have been righteously obtained, as in not stolen goods, I suppose, <laughs> including even the contents of one's arms bowl, and uses such things in common with virtuous members of the society. This is about monks, but it can be anyone. So this is very lovely because it's about generosity, and Tasha talked about that this morning as the kind of foundation for practice. And the reason it is the foundation is, again, because it's going against the stream of kind of accumulation, desire, self-interest, selfishness. You know, it's the opposite movement of giving, giving up, giving away, giving of oneself. And it can mean of material goods, it can also mean of one's time, of one's kind ear when somebody's in need, of somebody just to listen to them. You know, or even things like social work and attending to the sick. And the Buddha praises that. I mean, there's lots of stories in the suttas where um, somebody neglects a sick person and the Buddha admonishes them and says, you know, one who would look after me would look at, should look after the sick. And in one case, he himself went to kind of clean up this monk who soiled himself and was full of ulcers and boils. And, and um, he admonished his monks. And uh, they, they said, oh, well, that monk was no use to us anymore. And the Buddha said, my goodness, you know. It's not only when somebody's of use to you that you should look after them. You have this responsibility just as you would look after a Buddha or somebody you really respect and admire. So, And I have a lovely story about Because sometimes we think we have to have a lot in order to be generous, in order to give. And quite often when people donate to me as well, sometimes it's a big amount. And I've noticed a tendency for people to say, oh, that person's so generous, you know, because they gave a big amount. And I always think, well, not necessarily. I mean, perhaps for them it was easy to give. For other people it might be really difficult even to, you know, just give a couple of pounds or to make it all the way to the Vihara. You know, they have to pay for parking, they have to pay for petrol. So we can't judge on, on the basis of, like, how much we receive. And one of the most moving things that I can remember as an example of generosity that went straight to my heart and was very touching was, um, I think, 1995 when I was probably 20, I guess, travelling in South India. I was in, uh, I had a Tibetan partner at that time, and it was quite handy because he spoke Hindi, so that was great, actually. And we felt quite, you know, at ease. I, I felt a natural affinity to India anyway, and I always felt at ease there. But, um, yeah, so we were waiting for a train, just kind of hanging around somewhere on the pavement on the way. And... Uh, didn't look particularly tired or hungry or anything, but there was this street family and they were just living on the pavement, like under just plastic bags, I think it was, you know, sort of black plastic, maybe bin bags with some like wooden poles. And underneath there, the, the lady, the woman, had um, a little stove boiling and there was some kind of gruel on the stove and she invited us in. She beckoned us and said, come in Hindi probably, or whatever the local language was. Actually, it's not Hindi in there, it's... Um, I can't remember. But anyway, somehow language doesn't matter in these kind of situations because you know exactly what's being said and what's being offered. And it was just so touching, so we went in there. I don't remember if we ate anything, but there was such a dignity to this lady who offered, you know, without any kind of embarrassment or self-consciousness, she just felt like she had enough to share. And it was really beautiful. I always remember that as a, a true kind of expression of generosity and dignity. You know, she had a self-respect, and why not? It doesn't matter, you know, how much we have. We can always give something. We can always think of others. <coughs> and maybe that was why she seemed so happy, despite the poverty, because she did have this sense of there being something wider than herself. You know, and I think this is, again, the movement of generosity that it connects us to each other and makes us realise we're in this together. And, you know, we're not the only ones who have needs. So that's about the generosity, <coughs> the fourth one. And then the next principle of uh, cordiality 
is that one dwells both openly and privately, possessing in common with their fellow members of society, or people in the community, or perhaps people here at the barn, virtuous behaviour that's unbroken, flawless, unblemished, unblotched, freeing, praised by the wise, ungrasped and leading to stillness. This too is a principle of cordiality that conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute and concord and unity. And the last one is that one dwells openly and privately, possessing in common with the people around them a view that is noble and liberating, which leads out for one who acts upon it to complete destruction of suffering. Hmm. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord and unity. So this is very lovely, and of course if you know you have such a, a wise view of the world that it leads to the end of suffering, then where is the room for conflict? There can't be any conflict because there's nothing to defend anymore. There's nothing, you know, there's no inner conflict when, when you're free from suffering. So there was a nice story that I read recently about uh, also how we can learn to see the best in each other and create wholesome communities where there is a lot of concord and harmony. And it was a story about um, Hasidic monks, but I want to change it to Buddhist nuns because we don't have enough history <laughs> behind us. <laughs> so I'll just change it to Buddhist nuns. But in this community, um, many years ago, uh, it had been, you know, it had been there for many years, and now many of the nuns were getting old and and getting kind of a little bit tired and maybe not able to teach as well anymore. And because of this, maybe they were a little bit out of touch with the society as well, and what the society needed, you know, so they were becoming less and less relevant. And um, because of this, they were finding it difficult to get new recruits to that monastery. And so as the older nuns were dying, basically the community was dwindling, and they were very worried about the future of this place. So one day they tried to approach um, an elder from another region and um, ask what to do about it. So this was another nun from another place. And the other nun said, well, I don't know, there's really nothing I can say. I, I don't know how you can improve things, but remember one thing, that the Buddha is among you. <laughs> and they were like, huh? The Buddha is among us? And maybe it wasn't the real Buddha, but perhaps it could be an enlightened person that they just hadn't really recognised before. So they all started looking at each other quite differently and thinking, hmm, that one that sits in the corner really lazily, always leans on the wall, she, maybe she's just really chilled out, you know, maybe she's not lazy at all. And that one that seems kind of bossy, maybe she just knows that she has this spiritual authority and that she's actually, you know, our teacher. And maybe that one that's really irritating is actually put there just to try us and to see, you know, if we're going to react with anger, maybe that's the Buddha among us. And so because they didn't know who it was, they started treating each other with so much respect. And so much reverence, you know, attending on each other as if it was the Buddha or somebody very, very wise. And slowly, slowly, things started to change. The conduct changed, everybody's faces became radiant again, and people started living happily together. And bit by bit, it started to attract the younger nuns again. And so people started coming back to the monastery, and everything started to turn around. And this was all because they learned to look at each other in a different way. They learn to see each other anew, in a sense, instead of in their old conditioned ways. You know, even looking at what can be seen as faults, like these two bad bricks in the story, like on the back of the calendar. We look at these two bad bricks, like the ones that are a bit different, as some kind of fault in the wall. But actually, if you look at it more carefully, <coughs> is it really a fault? Maybe it's a feature. You know, maybe it's something that makes that wall quite unique. And in the same way, we all have our idiosyncrasies. It depends how we look at these things. So once they started to see each other differently, then it really brought out this great amount of happiness and an ability to live in harmony again with reverence and respect for each other. And we need to bring that sense of the sacred back, I think, into life. Especially when we go outside. I've just noticed over all these years how fast society has become, how quick and how there's really very little time to connect with what's important to us. And even for me with my project, I barely have any time to talk or write emails to my closest friends. You know, and people think, wow, she's just ignoring us, or maybe she's just aloof, she doesn't answer my email, sometimes for six months, you know, and there can be a, 
a bikuni who I, I never see, and there's very few of us, and I just can't get around to answering their emails. And it, it's really sad, actually. But we've always got each other. We've always got the people who are around at any given moment. You know, and we can do our best in those situations to just express our love in whatever way that may become. So there's quite a lot that I wanted to talk about, but I'll try not to get into too much detail about each bit because there's another sort of that talks about um, how to overcome resentment that's already arisen to somebody. And as well as loving kindness, this moves into the realm of having compassion. And I want to bring compassion in just to contrast it a bit with metta because you could liken metta to a kind of well-wishing for, say, a child who's quite happy and doing well in life and, you know, very young and got everything to look forward to. So it's very easy to generate well-wishing towards them. But compassion is more when you see somebody suffering. So this can be compared to the way a mother might feel about her child who's sick. And sometimes people who upset us, you know, we feel that there's maybe something wrong with them or they're just bad people, but we don't realise that they're hurting, you know. They're really hurting and it's as if they are sick or afflicted with some illness and they don't know how to handle that, you know. And quite often when people hurt us, they don't really realise the power of those words and the effect that it has on us. You know, even with things like the political system, which I don't want to get too much into, but, you know, for example, Brexit, whether you agree with it or not, Probably most people voted for what they thought would genuinely bring benefit to this country. Mm -hmm. We might not agree with them, but I doubt very much that they deliberately voted in a way that they thought would bring division or you know, decimate the health service or whatever else it was, cause so much trouble and so many millions and billions of pounds worth of deficit. You know, They probably didn't vote for that. So they still voted for what they thought was best. I'm not saying, well, I sort of am saying what I think. <laughs> but uh, we need to see the other side of things, you know, because if you did see that person and talk to them about their reasons, you'd probably find that they're also just trying to do their best and struggling in their own ways, you know. We're all struggling in some way or another. So compassion's really important, and this is, you know, like one of the armours that we put on, like the other day I gave the simile about going into a fire, and wanting to put the fire out and needing to wear like a protective suit, fire resistant suit. So we have loving kindness as one of those protective shields and also compassion. And then the other one that the Buddha talks about, to face anything. I mean, it, it can be to deal with people who you find difficult or it can be to deal with the worldly vicissitudes. We need equanimity for that. And equanimity gives us this sense of confidence and acceptance that life is, in a sense, out of control. You know, and we're always trying to control <coughs> things that are beyond our control. And this causes a lot of struggle. So equanimity has this kind of beautiful, broad, expansive sense of acceptance, understanding that things arise and they do pass away. I mean, not just to be kind of like a doormat and, and watch everything go wrong, but sometimes we've done our best. You know, we've given all our love and compassion and there's just nothing more we can do. So equanimity is the best way forward. You know, and when you feel like there's no ground and things are out of control, you always have the reference of your own body. You, know, you always have that as a kind of anchor. You can combat the sensations there. And you can see straight away with things like body sensations that they are passing. You know, pleasure and pain pass like night and day. You can't have one without the other. And really, you can only define pleasure by the pain that went before it and vice versa. So what are these things anyway? They're very, very ephemeral and very changing. And also, if there was only pleasure, I mean, you wouldn't actually experience it as pleasure anymore. You know, the devas are supposed to live in states of permanent happiness in the kind of Brahma realms, we say. It's similar to states of very deep metta. You know, these are very pleasant, but if you were always in that, you wouldn't really notice it. And you wouldn't have much fuel for growth or much of a challenge for growth. So the pain is also part of life and you know it can teach us a lot about how to respond in a wise way. Yeah. So as well as pleasure and pain, the Buddha says there's um, praise and dispraise. And that's an interesting one because I think we do usually receive quite a lot of, is it the right word, dispraise in life and probably give quite a lot, if not verbally, mentally. <laughs> but you know, these things too are just very fleeting. And if we get attached to them, we really suffer, especially if we create identities out of them. Because th they do say more about the person who gives the praise and who gives the blame than they really say about you. 
It depends on their mood, it depends on their own perceptions of what they think is appropriate, socially, environmentally, whatever. You know, we're all conditioned in those ways. And then there's uh, fame and disrepute, which is even more empty, you know. People come into fame these days just for like five minutes. In the past, at least, number one records used to last for like weeks and weeks and weeks and lead to albums and bands that kind of lasted, you know. But nowadays, it's just bloop, bloop, bloop. doesn't mean anything. So, and then the last one is gain and loss, yeah. So this is, again, totally out of our hands quite often. So there's this nice little story as well that Ajahn Brahm tells. I think it's a Zen story. And um, there was this monk who was living on an island somewhere in a lake. And the main monastery was quite a long way away. So he'd gone there for solitary retreat for years and years and years. And uh, he'd got a little bit into his practice and obviously was developing a bit of a, I don't know, maybe a sense that he was getting enlightened. And um, one day he decided to send his abbot a letter to tell him about his progress and he wrote to his abbot and sent it over with the boat because I think the boat used to have to come and like supply him with food that he needed on his island and he said something like um, the wise sage is no longer shaken by the four worldly winds or the eight worldly winds so these ones that I just discovered I think it was the four worldly winds so they're like pears and, uh, <coughs> and he sent this letter to the abbot thinking oh I'm really excited, what's the abbot going to say now, you know, because I'm so equanimous and I've been practicing so long and my mind's free from all suffering and all defilements. And sometimes you can think that way, especially if you don't meet real life, right, or meet many challenges. So the abbot was very um, witty in a way, and uh, he saw it and he read, oh, the, uh, the wise sage, and he, and he scratched it out and wrote in red pen, fart. <laughs> he's no longer moved and he did the same thing, fart there were four sentences anyway I forget, but by the four fart, worldly winds fart <laughs> and then he sent this letter back to the uh, island where this monk was still meditating and he apparently had quite a bit of time to go, he was supposed to be there for several years, but when he got this letter he read it and he was absolutely aghast, it was like how can this horrendous teacher, you know, disrespectful teacher, writes such coarse words, doesn't he recognise that I'm enlightened, you know, how dare he spoil my beautiful poem and my calligraphy in that way with his red ink and so he got, before he knew what he was doing, he got in the boat and started travelling back to the main monastery and slammed the letter down on the abbot's desk and said, what is this and then the abbot very calmly read it back to him the wise monk fought is no longer move, fart, etc., by the four worldly winds. So how come four little farts just blew you across the lake? <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing, right? If we don't actually come in contact with these things in, a, in the outside world, we might think that we're much further ahead than we really are, and sometimes we need some kind of you know, somebody to say something that we don't quite like, to see our weaknesses, to see where we're still reactive and we're still clinging <coughs> to this sense of self. So I think in that story, the monk quickly flew back over to the island again and had to do some more work for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay, you can all come back here as well. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted also to talk a little bit about right speech again, because it's just such an important part of the practice and something that we really need to develop in the outside world and in relation to each other and um, I actually forgot to bring the most beautiful part which I read out on the introduction day but it was talking about the opposites of abstinence from unwholesome speech and it was talking about actually speaking so instead of like what is it um, for my higher so instead of false speech one speaks words which are true words which are trustworthy reliable yeah, words that do not deceive others and that bring people together and give confidence yeah and then there's like, for my... Instead of malicious speech, we speak words which unite, words which promote concord and unity. Yeah? Words which soothe the heart and which go straight to the heart. So beautiful words that uplift the heart instead of malicious speech. And the next one is harsh speech. So instead of harsh, we speak words which are gentle, which are timely, which are full of loving kindness, considering the person's benefit. So we're actively using speech in a way to promote happiness in the world rather than just, okay, 
I'll just keep quiet and not say anything negative. And then the last one was not to use words which are like gossip, just speaking about trivial things and wasting people's time, but to speak words which are worthy of recording and which, you know, actually offer something in life, words that don't waste other people's time and that respect people. So sometimes saying less is actually more. But as well as these beautiful words, there's also places in the suttas which talk about how to give praise and dispraise. Because I think one of the difficulties sometimes in community is that we feel that it's not Buddhist to say anything negative. And I've seen this, and sometimes that just gives way, like we were saying yesterday, for people with the strongest voice or the strongest negative voice to actually take over in a community. You know, And everybody's afraid to say anything about that person because they feel like, oh, it's not kind or... You know, we should only say positive things. But in the suttas, the Buddha actually says that one should, after examining and scrutinizing a person, so investigating whether they're worthy of praise or dispraise, we should actually praise those worthy of praise and dispraise those worthy of dispraise. So the idea is that we don't praise those worthy of dispraise, yeah? or dispraise those worthy of praise. We actually have to see things as they really are, and if we find, after being very honest and using our yeah. intelligence to really assess the situation, actually dispraise things that are worthy of dispraise. Yeah? But the Buddha says you have to do it in a way which is accurate, truthful, and timely. So this thing about timely always comes in. And I was reflecting on what that means, because often I think of it in terms of like whether that person's ready to receive it, or whether you might be in the right... Uh, like it could be, say, if you've gone to court, it, it might be a timely situation to put your part across, but not when the other person's putting their part across. But also timely can mean when you don't have like anger in your mind at that moment. Yeah? So it's timely in the sense that you know that the other person's ready and you know that you're also in a balanced frame of mind. And this comes again and again. And, uh, and the other thing is about harsh speech, because sometimes we feel we've always got to be quite sort of I don't know, like careful about the way we speak, but sometimes you need to speak a little bit harshly. But the Buddha says, and it's very rare, and I mean, I really try not to do that, but <coughs> sometimes it's necessary. I mean, one obvious example is if a child's running out in front of a car, you know, you have to say, hey, you know, there's a car, get back. Mm. You know, you just have to speak in a way that's very forceful and that gets that person's attention. But at other times too, he says that if something is actually beneficial, truthful, Truthful, beneficial, and one more thing. Truthful, beneficial. Oh, I'll have to check. Uh, true, correct, and beneficial. Yeah, true, correct, and beneficial. And it must be beneficial, because things are often true and correct, and we think we've got to mm. say them, right? But is it really benefiting you or the other person? So this is the real bit. And unless those three are there, it's better just not to say it. But if those three are all present then he says that you can utter speech which is harsh, or which is slightly loud or slightly rushed, perhaps, knowing the right time. So again, it's all about timing. Yeah. So I found that quite lovely. And um, yeah, there's just one more little sutta I want to read about speech, because I think it's so important. And this one is really interesting, because it talks about um, how to frame language in a way that doesn't criticise the person, but criticises the action. And this is a really important one, especially if we are going into the realm of, you know, giving, like not praising people or, you know, saying things which are difficult for a person to hear. We need to know how to do it in a way that actually doesn't get all their defences up and become like a personal attack. So it's something that takes a lot of practice, I think, and certainly <coughs> I also need to practice this. It's a little bit similar to um, non-violent communication, where you're trying to get at like the underlying message that the person is trying to put across. And you know, when you're receiving something that another person says, you listen for where it's coming from rather than the words themselves. And also, when you're giving the feedback, you know, trying to check in with what your feeling is, not just what a judgment of them is. Yeah. So we often say things like, "I'm feeling um, criticised." But that is like saying, you're criticising me. That's not a feeling. Criticised is not a feeling. But saying, I feel hurt, or I feel sad, is a feeling. I think even hurt is a difficult one, because it's like saying, you hurt me. So it's very, very subtle. I mean, I would totally recommend actually uh, reading some of that, and maybe forming groups and practising things like non-violent communication, which is something I'd love to do if I had the time. So let me see if I can find this other one. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I won't 
can't find it now. But basically, the way it talks about um, giving feedback is to say, for example, yesterday we read out a little bit from um, the Arana Vibhanga Sutta, which is about um, pursuing happiness and the right kind of happiness. So instead of saying all those people, the Buddha says, don't say all those people engaged in sense pleasures are pursuing the wrong way and leading to the wrong kind of happiness. But instead, you put it as the pursuit of sensual pleasures is the wrong way and leads to suffering. Yeah? So instead of saying all those people doing such and such, such and such, are doing the wrong thing, you just talk about the thing in itself being unskillful and leading to suffering. So this is a very different kind of paradigm, which I think is quite lovely. So as well as this, I think wise friendship is a really important thing to try and cultivate when you're back outside. Because we are conditioned entities, there's nothing inherent inside of any of us that can be unaffected by the society or the conditions we find ourselves in. And this is one of the understandings of non-self. It helps to me to explain why the Buddha said that wise friendship is the whole of the holy life, in other words, the whole of the spiritual path. And sometimes, you know, you think, how come it can be the whole of it? You know, surely that I can do it on my own. Or, But if you notice very carefully, even if you don't have a meditation group or a lot of spiritual friends, you have to have the teachings at the very least in order to find a different way. We can't do it on our own because we're just subject to the influences and the input of whatever's around us. So I always think of wise friendship also as including things like what we read, you know, things like newspapers, media, Facebook, you know, all the kind of stuff that can really spin you out and get you sucked in. Yeah. <coughs> so what kind of messages are we allowing ourselves to be exposed to? It's important to notice that and to see, again, whether these things are leading to the wholesome states and increasing or not. And also, in terms of uh, friendship, the Buddha says that there are like certain qualities you should look for in a real friend. So these are like, they give what's hard to give. They endure what's hard to endure. Um, I think they preserve your secrets and they tell you their secrets. So there's that sense of intimacy there. But also that they don't forsake you when things are difficult, which I think is very lovely because that's often when you know who your real friends are, you know, when you're going through a difficult time. And you know, maybe you're not able to be as kind or as sweet as you normally are or spend as much time with somebody, but they don't leave you because of that because they see that you need them more than ever, actually. And it's the same, say, with a person we find difficult. Sometimes they're the hardest person to generate metta to, but they're the ones most in need of it. You know? And they're also the ones that we need to give it to the most, because otherwise we will just dwell in aversion, and it doesn't help any situation. So this wise friendship is really important, and you know, I think this can be extended to, obviously, your personal life, but also, say, if you want to uh, find a place to live, or even a workplace, what kind of people are you around at work? It's important to protect yourself. The Buddha said, you know, that having a conducive place to live is really, really one of the highest blessings and the most important thing. Because again, it's conditioning us. And if the unwholesome states are increasing, he said, just leave that place and try and find somewhere new. Not straight away. I mean, I've stayed in communities for like a long time before I realised that, okay, it really isn't working, you know, because first you can try and change your attitude. But certainly protecting yourself from things like any sort of... Um, bullying, you know, in the workplace or, or in, at home, and also manipulation. So loving kindness should be giving us those kind of boundaries and those kind of abilities to protect ourselves and to realise when things are going, you know, in negative, unwholesome ways and they're not leading to your well-being in the long run. And then having that confidence to make the change, to get out of that situation if you can. Yeah. So also in terms of the way we live our life, how can we live with more metta? And one of them, I think, is about just learning to live in a very conscientious way. Like, what are we using as resources? Where do we shop? What's the origin of the food that we're buying? You know, is it ethically produced or not? And also, how much do we consume? And how much do we really need to consume? Yeah. Is that consuming, depleting the resources, or taking more than is really due to us? You know, so trying to shop ethically. I mean, I don't know much about it because I'm a nun, but <laughs> but I'm sure there are differences in the way things are produced. One of my friends works for Transition Time, which is um, like a big kind of market system, as far as I know. But they do lots of <coughs> stuff, and um, she runs the market for Crystal Palace in London. 
and she always goes to check where everything's produced, you know, so if she's having like eggs or whatever, she goes to the farms and she makes sure the chickens are being kept well. And this is really lovely because there are ways to find out these days, the information's out there. And it's also, I think, about, you know, just learning to care for ourselves in a way that's not only like having the hot chocolate or the hot bath, but actually self-care includes developing and living a lifestyle that you don't need to constantly run away from and find an escape from, right? Because sometimes we do these things and we say we're caring for ourselves, but actually there's something amiss in the way we're living. Perhaps we're not really living in line with our integrity or our deepest values and aspirations. And of course, it's not easy to live a life entirely aligned to that, but at least we can be inclining that way. And I think no matter what's happening in society, you know, it's so important to keep that alive as a possibility and never to think that you can't do anything just because you can't change everything around you. Because we can always do our little bit, and maybe the time has come where we have to focus much more on like our local communities <laughs> and just see what we can contribute there, because everybody has something to contribute. <coughs> going to groups also doing work say with like trying to um, undo patriarchy I know there are undoing patriarchy groups there are also like I was <coughs> I am sort of on the periphery of a group that's not quite fully um, formed yet but it's white white anti-racism group so it's like an affinity group where you get together with people of your gender or your race to talk about Basically, your attitudes, I think, towards you know people of colour or towards marginalised groups, and to try and see where the systems are perpetuating these problems. And the idea of doing it with people of your own colour or gender is that you're not kind of asking too much emotional labour of the marginalised group, because it'd be so easy to go up to people in those groups and say, "Well, tell me what your experience is. How is it hurting you?" You know. What can we do about it? But that's putting the onus on them, and I think we need to look at our own stuff, especially our own shame and our own guilt around these things. And so sometimes working in this kind of <coughs> context and just doing some of the groundwork, you know, about the history of these civilizations that are built on slavery and racism, yeah? and trying to understand that before we come back again together in the mixed groups. So I really appreciate that at the barn they, you're doing some of this. You know, you're having like men's groups and and women's groups, and hopefully people of colour groups at some point, and the LGBTQIA <coughs> groups, really important. Yeah. So I think there's a new initiative in Sydney actually by one of the um, gay monks, and he actually was at Bodhinyana at my teacher's monastery, but he just felt that he he also needed to be out of that context as a marginalised person and to do something that he felt was more empowering for him and that could connect with other members of his community. And now he's got a group called Rainbody, which is really nice looking play on words. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great, you know, and people are coming there that might not feel safe to go to other places. So suitable place means it must feel safe, it must feel welcoming. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think sometimes we're not aware of how unwelcoming it can be if we're not the privileged group in any system. But it makes a difference. I mean, we were talking about the tea ceremonies earlier because you were mentioning cream about tea. And I was like, yeah, tea's really important. But, you know, I really see the point of something <coughs> like a tea ceremony where you're sort of tuning up with like, all the subtleties in the tea and preparing it in a really careful way and then sharing it with each other and sipping it and taking your time, you know, in a very beautiful environment. Because it's calming the senses and it's creating this sense of like togetherness and safety. Right? and a place where we can just instantly go a little bit deeper more quickly. Otherwise, you know, it's quite common, isn't it, when you come into a meditation hall to feel a little bit like, oh, I'm not quite arrived here yet, you know. So we need to, like, gently, gently bring ourselves in and feel like we can bring the whole of ourselves into a space. So anything that can help to do this, I think, is really important. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the transition from um, being on retreat here to going outside and maybe give a little, a few little tips or hints. I mean, probably most of you are quite familiar with this process and we can talk more about it later if you wish. But, um, but one of the things I think is to just go slowly because sometimes, especially perhaps in a retreat like this, we feel that we've already been interacting. So we might not realise that we've actually gone quite deep. We have gone <coughs> into a different space. And I think, you know, some of the conversations have shown me also, the amount that I've shared has shown me that, yeah, 
something special has happened actually in this group and between us that there has been a, a feeling of developing trust and safety over these days and it's quite special this is not the way it always is outside you know these communities take time to create and it's been very quick in a way. Five days is very quick, but it's gone quite deep. And so you might not realise quite how sensitive you are. And so I think when you go outside, I mean, try to just reintroduce yourself to the world, especially the world of news and media, very gently and taking time to breathe and reconnect with yourself, you know, anchoring yourself in the body, doing some loving kindness and just really respecting your own um, vulnerability in that way. Yeah, because even if you have to go straight back to work, there's always opportunities to just take a break. My teacher always says there's a toilet. Mm. You know, mm. if you don't have a meditation space at your work, go into the toilet and tell the boss like, I need a vest, or I'm on the toilet. I'm constipated. That's what mm. he says. Yeah, <laughs> I'm constipated, <laughs> mentally constipated. <laughs> but they won't ask you exactly which end is constipated, so don't worry. <laughs> And, you know, you can close the door for five, ten minutes and nobody's going to disturb you. So you can do that and just, you know, repeat some phrases to yourself or even visualise yourself in a safe space if you have a special place where you feel resourced. Maybe it's the barn, maybe it's some other place, maybe it's under the sunshine on a beach. And you can just kind of go to that place, you know, and just connect with yourself and, and really visualise that you're in this, like, restful place so that you can calm down quickly and just feel a little bit more resourced. And even if it doesn't, you don't feel it's doing very much and you're still just as agitated, it does do something, because you're putting the brakes on. It's also a good idea to do it if you do feel you're getting irritated or angry. You know, go and literally divert your attention. You know, drink a glass of water. All those kind of old-fashioned things, count to ten or whatever, backwards, or I don't know. <laughs> whatever it is. But I think... Um, it's really important in daily life to be able to carve out time to practice and to have at least a couple of sessions every day, no matter how long they are, just to meditate. You know, Just have a place in your house which is used just for that purpose, like have a cushion, maybe put some of your images of people who inspire or like the Buddha statue or the Kuan Yin or whatever it is, photos of a special place, maybe friends, and just have it as your corner. Maybe you need a bamboozle too, but there's only one. <laughs> and I need him too or them, I need them so, but you know, anything that makes you feel like this is my little corner and maybe there's like a low lamp or some candles or whatever just to kind of have that mental association that now it's quiet time and one of the things that I like about the Dalai Lama he says that he wakes up every day and he reflects first thing about um, isn't it amazing that I'm alive and I've got this human body and I've got the capacity to do good I'm healthy, I've got food in the fridge, I've got a roof over my head. I was reading recently that we're, if we've got those two things, just a roof and food in the fridge, we're in the top 10%, I think, of the world in terms of wealth. And this is without having a lot of money in the bank or any of that. So this is really incredible, and we just take it for granted. You know, I mean, sometimes the food in my fridge depletes a little bit, but, you know, it always comes back again, and I'm always just quite amazed that I can have a full fridge without having gone to the shops. It's just a miracle, you know, and it's something to really dwell on and think, gosh, I am in a position to be of service today. And then I also think to start the day by getting in contact with your kind of intentions, yeah, making an aspiration, but also making an aspiration not to do harm, for example. You know? So today I'm going to try my best to be harmless in this world. And just set your intention, not with any kind of pressure, but just in a way that sets you up. You know, so you can contact that wish and it's more likely that throughout the day you'll remember that and if at any time you do find that you're harming yourself or anybody else through being irritated or tired or whatever it is it may just kick in you know. so you can do this first of all and then a nice thing to do that I found is a sort of qualities that support the metta and one of these is gratitude and I think having a daily gratitude practice can be really really helpful so I did this during the Mains retreat, actually, whenever I would be getting a little bit upset about things and feeling a bit stuck <coughs> in my emotions. I'd just write, make myself write three things that happened that I was grateful for today. And it's amazing how quickly it can change your whole mind around, you know. And you can read it again on other days, and you just end up getting these huge lists of things. 
So one thing is to write down what you're grateful for and another is to just note down that any little kindnesses that were shown to you or any little kindnesses that you showed to others because you'll be surprised there are lots throughout the day. And it's beautiful to recollect those. And again, you know, the more you recollect these things, the more likely they are to be at the front of your mind. It's like you're programming your mindfulness to recognise them and therefore your mind to actually do them again and again. Especially when you see that it makes you happy just to reflect on them. And also at night, you know, when you go to bed, just try and recollect something that you've done that you feel happy about, like some quality in yourself that you can really appreciate and that is hopefully growing, or even a quality that you wish to grow. You maybe don't have it yet, but there's some beauty in the intention to develop it as well and contacting that. And then every night before you go to bed, just spending a few moments to send metta to yourself and then to send metta to all beings. You can use the same phrases, you know, you don't have to like visualise all beings. But it just helps to expand the mind. So you send the metta to yourself, you just calm yourself when you're in bed. I mean I find it really nice to go through the body almost like a shavasana for those who've done yoga. It's like you just lie down on your back or however you're comfortable. And you just gently, gently go through and relax and with the kindness and the mindfulness, you know, just spread your attention and relax your body. And then after that just spend a few moments sending metta all beings and that way you'll sleep better and you'll wake up hopefully happier and if you're really lucky like Yuli you'll even or Huli isn't it you'll even dream of metta she mm. said she had a dream where she felt really warm full of metta and this is what can start to happen when you keep on planting those seeds you know they just bear fruit at the most unlikely of times so these are all ways that you can bring metta into your daily life and yeah just going back outside really taking your time and I would say just try not to get swept up in whatever's going on like in the news, at the national level and focus again on the person and the thing right in front of you. And to end, I guess I can't resist telling the three emperors questions because Sajjan Brown uses it again and again and it seems to fit really nicely. And uh, I think it comes from Tolstoy, from Leo Tolstoy. And uh, it's just the three questions. What is the most important time? So what should I come? Yeah. <laughs> and it's always now, that's the nice thing, it's actually always now, it's never another time. <laughs> Even if we're in the future in our head, we're in the future now. <laughs> so now is always there. And the next thing is, um, who is the most important person? Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. And it is, sometimes it is. It's the one right in front of you. So this is very nice because when you close your eyes, you are the one in front of you, right? You're the most important person. But most of the day, you won't be the one in front of you. You can still connect to yourself. You can still stay connected with this one because it should be to all as to oneself. But it's the one right in front of you, whoever you're talking to at any given moment. And I was so relieved to hear this talk by Ajahn Brown because I'd always felt there was something wrong with this idea of continual mindfulness. And I noticed one of my fellow nuns at one point, whenever I talked to her, she'd seem very agitated, like I was distracting from her breath, you know, and she had to stay with her breath at all costs, and having to talk to me was like a real... Her attention was somehow dis divided and struggling between the two, and it just felt like not being fully met. And I, I kind of intuited that there was something not quite right about that. And then when I heard this teaching that, you know, your practice is to just be with whatever is in front of you, and it doesn't only mean the person... It also means the activity that you're doing. You know, if you're stuck in the traffic jam, the traffic jam is the most important thing in the world. You can always make peace with any situation, you know, and so just really be with that traffic jam. It's like the traffic lights are telling you to stop, so okay, I stop. There's nothing I can do about it anyway. Just don't go to sleep or whatever because you've got to watch for when the lights go back to green. But whatever is in right in front of you is your practice. It's not that you have to get back to the cushion to practice. Otherwise, you'll always feel that, you know, you need to... You're kind of wishing your life away, actually. And then the last of the Emperor's questions is, um, what's the most important thing to do? And don't say if you've been on your treats with Ajahn Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the object. Mm -hmm. You're in the now, you've got the object, the most important object or person. What's the most important thing to do? To care. To care is the most important thing to do. 
So the Buddhist practice is not about being aloof and removed and detached, it's about caring. That means engaging. So it's the mindfulness again that knows the object, it's the kindness that relates properly to that object, to whatever it is you're doing or whoever <coughs> is right there. And if it's you, please be extra kind, because we can be our own worst critics, far too hard on ourselves and far too biased actually against ourselves most of the time. So try to become your own advocate and speak up for yourself, especially when the critic kicks in. You know, you can take it to court. <laughs> challenge it <laughs> well actually this is why I did that and it was coming from a good place you know and maybe it wasn't skillful but I'm learning thank you very much so please just go back to sleep and mm -hmm. I know you're trying to protect me but I don't need you right now thank you very much so learn to speak kindly to yourself and learn to behave in kind ways as best you can in any given situation and even if that means calling things out when they're wrong Learning the right time, the right way to do it is important, you know, and then you can really start to make some change. So that's all for me, and I've gone over time a little bit, so we'll have a five-minute break or so, and then we'll do some more meditation.